Good morning, Grace. Uh, I want to welcome you to another day in the Proverbs, the 26th day in the Proverbs. Uh, I can uh, see that we have uh, Proverbs 26 before us today. Um, uh, I am really, really glad that um, that this proverb fell to me um, because of verse 4 and 5, uh, which I, I absolutely love um, for a couple of reasons. Uh, but let's go ahead and pray and um, let's make it our goal today to gain wisdom, to gain insight, uh, to gain fresh perspective, um, to uh, let it be our goal today to be able to tackle this problem better. Um, let's pray. Heavenly Father, uh, thank you, God, so much for your word. Thank you that your wor word reveals who you are, uh, that your word reveals what you have done, um, uh, that is in creation and the, the type of world that you have established and the type of God you are and the type of behavior uh, that you expect. Um, and not only that, God, I thank you that your word reveals uh, how even though we have all fallen short, um, there is hope for everyone who will repent, repent from their rebellious ways and return to you uh, the right standard, the standard of rightness, the standard of righteousness, uh, the standard of, of every virtue. Um, God, uh, I thank you so much uh, for the gospel of Jesus Christ. Um, Lord, as we come to your word today, uh, it is my desire to communicate um, what your word says, especially, specifically with dealing how to answer uh, people and their questions. Um, God, uh, we I, I struggle with this sometimes, and I know that others probably do too. So God, I just ask that you would give us insight through your word, that you would grow us, that you would build our knowledge, build our wisdom, um, and let it be rightly oriented on, on who you are. Uh, and, and let it be for the right purpose of bringing you glory. Thank you. Uh, in Jesus' name, amen. So um, I'm going to read the first few verses of Proverbs 26, and I'm going to read a couple of more uh, because this this question is is really kind of um, it, it's one that that we deal with, uh, especially if we are geared towards evangelism, uh, and depending on the the place where we live, uh, we have a variety of questions put to us, and and I would like us as the church to know when to answer and to know when not to answer. Uh, and to know how to answer. Um, so I, I want to make it clear that my goal today is not to solve the great debate and fully explain verse 4 and 5. I would love to be able to do that, um, but the problem is, is that I still don't always know when it's best to answer and when it's not best to answer. Um, so what I'm hoping to do is, is, is enhance or, or maybe give you a different perspective on how to answer. Um, and, uh, and I'm hoping uh, that, that we can put this into practice better. Um, I don't pretend to be able to, uh, to fully explain every aspect of Scripture. I think that uh, with experience and with uh, uh, counsel from a variety of godly people, uh, you, we can all gain a better perspective on how to answer, when to answer, uh, and when to um, walk away. It uh, wasn't my uh, intention to sound like a, uh, um, oh, I forget the country singer's name, but anyway. Um, so, uh, like snow in summer or rain in harvest, honor is not fitting for a fool. Like a fluttering sparrow or a darting swallow, an undeserved curse does not come to rest. A whip for the horse, a bridle for the donkey, and a rod for the back of fools. Do not answer a fool according to his folly or you yourself will be just like him. Answer a fool according to his folly, or he will be wise in his own eyes. Sending a message by the hands of a fool is like cutting off one's feet or drinking poison. Like the useless legs of one who is lame is a proverb in the mouth of a fool. Like tying a stone in a sling is the giving of honor to a fool. Like a thorn bush in a drunkard's hand is a proverb in the mouth of a fool. Like an archer who wounds at random is one who hires a fool or any passerby. As a dog returns to its vomit, so fools re repeat their folly. Do you see a person wise in their own eyes? There is more hope for a fool than for them. Um, 
So I'm going to stop there with the consecutive reading. And I just want to uh, remind us of a couple of things about the fool. Um, because one, identifying a fool uh, uh, is, is important to know whether or not and how exactly to answer a person. Um, first of all, we already know from the Proverbs uh, that, a, that a fool is a person whose foundation of knowledge and uh, the use of that knowledge, that is how they use that knowledge together with experience, um, those foundations are not God's word. We know that specifically because Proverbs 1-7 uh, tells us that the beginning of knowledge is the fear of the Lord. Uh, we rightly apprehend the Lord only through his word. Uh, so uh, we can put it together that a fool, uh, their knowledge of, of truth or their base and foundation of knowledge, which they claim, uh, which they should live their life by, is not God's word. So we know that about the fool. Uh, and we also know that the use of that knowledge also does not come from the Bible. So uh, we know that the fool, uh, his basis of wisdom and knowledge uh, is himself. It's his own accumulated judgment and experiences and what he has deemed is true or is not true. His foundation is himself which is why he ends up being so foolish. Let's look at a couple of things in Proverbs 26, 26 that show us this. Um, Proverbs 26, 1 says that just like snow in, in the summertime or rain in harvest time, honor is not fitting for a fool. So, okay, number one, we know that honor belongs to God, right? God created everything. So even if a person does something right, the credit goes to God who created him. And a wise person would understand this. Uh, that's why... Uh, Christians have uh, such a hard time accepting praise. That is, I should say, a Christian who is uh, really diligent about his thought life and about his, uh, his or her pride is going to be very careful about accepting any kind of praise or honor and is going to be very careful about turning that honor back to God because he or she understands that God is the one who deserves to be honored. So it's not right to honor a fool because that person whose base, uh, whose knowledge base and wisdom's, uh, wisdom base is not God's word, is going to accept all credit for himself. And we see that uh, in verse uh, 5. If you answer a fool in accordance with his folly, or according to his folly, he's going to be wise in his own eyes. And then we see the same thing, even though he doesn't directly uh, call him a fool, in verse uh, 12. He said, do you see a person wise in their own eyes? There's actually more hope for a fool than for them. Uh, so if a person, um, if their standard of wisdom is themselves, they're always the one, the, the hero of their story, so to speak. Um, they're, always, uh, they're always a hero in their own eyes. They're always the smartest one in the room. They're always one, the cleverest one in the room, uh, uh, most talented, most successful, whatever the case may be. They're always the best. And so um, uh, when, a, when a fool is honored, that honor is not returned to God. So it's not appropriate to honor a fool. Uh, and so uh, the other thing that we can see about a fool is the hopelessness or the um, futility, the uselessness, the emptiness of being a fool. Uh, so in verse 15, um, a sluggard, which is one of the, uh, I, I would say a sluggard is, is one of the um, results of foolishness, right? If your standard of knowledge and wisdom is not the, who God is, according to his word, uh, then you're, one of the ways you could end up is a, is a sluggard, is a lazy person. So he says, a sluggard buries his hand in the dish. He's too lazy to bring, bring it back to his mouth. Now, this is kind of a, um, maybe an exaggerated, exaggerated way of describing a lazy person. Um, but it also tells us a truth about a lazy person is that his laziness will be his undoing. Um, he's not going to profit. He's not going to be successful from laziness. Another verse I want to look at is verse 17 that shows us the same principle. Like one who grabs a stray dog by the ears is someone who rushes into a quarrel, not their own. So again, we have a, a foolish person getting involved 
uh, in, in, in a problem that is, or a fight that's not, doesn't involve them directly. They're just getting involved because they want to be the center of attention or, or whatever the reason may be. They want other people to see how wise they are in solving situations. But he said, that's just like grabbing a stray dog by the ears. And of course, we know what the result of that would be. Then in verse 27, whoever digs a pit will fall into it. If someone rolls a stone, it will roll back on them. And so we see, uh, once again, with another description, uh, a physical, um, I don't want to say it, um, anyway, a, a physical example, right? We have this guy uh, pushing a, a stone, ostensibly uphill, and he says the stone's going to roll back on them, right? Um, and, 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 or a person who digs a pit, and the idea here would be to trap something, uh, to catch something, and he's, he, he's the one who's going to fall into it. Uh, we see the same illustration given later for sin, um, that a person who sets a snare is like the the sin, I'm sorry, the, the person who sins is going to end up falling in that, just like the person who digs a pit is going to fall in their own trap. So, um, he tells us that the end of the foolish person is actually counterproductive. It's, it's not going to get them the success or the honor or whatever it is that they're, that is their desire. Why? And it's important to understand why. It's because their um, knowledge and their wisdom is not the word of God, not the character of God, not the expectations of God, not the reality uh, of God and his sovereign control uh, in the world, um, and the fact that we're all going to be judged one day. So it's, not, it's not based on an appropriate fear of God. Uh, and, and again, we see that the foolish person is working for his own honor and for his own glory. And in the end, uh, all that he works for, or all that she works for, um, will be lost to them. They won't get what it is they're after, whether it's honor or wealth or, or, or whatever it is. So then how do we use this information to answer or not answer a fool? So I'm going to go ahead and read verse 4 and 5 again. Do not answer a fool according to his own folly, or you yourself will be just like him. Answer a fool according to his folly, or he will be wise in his own eyes. So the first part is telling us, uh, really, I think uh, he says, don't answer a fool according to his own folly. Remember the, what we said about the fool. Um, we have this understanding of according to. That could mean several things. The phrase according to could mean several things. Here he says, don't answer a fool according to his folly. Well, what does he mean by that? Um, I have read some things and, and listened to some other people talk about this, and some people would tell you, well, it depends on what kind of a fool you're dealing with. Um, I, I'm not sure I understand what, what they're going uh, for with that. I'm not going to say they're wrong, because I'm just not sure what their, their point is here. I think that the, the point here in verse 4 is in accordance with his folly. Um, Many times we're asked foolish uh, questions, uh, especially by atheists, sometimes by people from other, um, uh, other religions, and they're questions that are designed to make us look foolish. They're questions that are designed um, to point out something they think in the Bible is foolish, or they think about um, uh, the doctrines of Christianity uh, that are foolish, that in their eyes that are foolish, and they're trying to make us look foolish um, in the process, and, and also trying to uh, make themselves look better. So he says, don't answer a fool according to his folly. And, and, and think with me here. You have a person whose knowledge and wisdom is based on the Word of God, or if you will, to use the, the, the modern way of, of speaking, uh, their worldview is based on the Word of God. And then you have another person, the fool, whose worldview is not based on the Word of God. But like we see clearly here in the Proverbs, their worldview is based on their own individual accumulated knowledge and experience. The knowledge that they judge, whether, to, whether or not to assimilate that into their, um, into their knowledge base, they judge based on themselves. So this person is, is, is only wise in their own eyes. Their worldview is based on their own knowledge, their own experience, their own wisdom, whereas the other person's is based on the Word of God. So when you're in a situation with a foolish person 
whose knowledge and wisdom and all of those things are based on their, their, their own selves only, only what they deem right and true, uh, and you're trying to answer them on the basis of the Word of God, um, uh, uh, rather, I'm sorry, uh, you don't want to get sucked into the, the advice of the first verse. That's the advice of the, the, advice of the first verse uh, is that you don't want to get sucked into answering according to their worldview. And I'll give you an example of this. In, um, in uh, Luke chapter 20, uh, same section uh, Jay recently went through uh, in the messages that he was talking about, the triple trap. Uh, so in, verse, uh, in chapter 20, verse, um, starting verse 27, uh, the Sadducees come to ask Jesus, uh, about uh, a question about the resurrection. Now, keep in mind, their goal here is to make him look foolish. And they are basing their question to, ex to try and expose the foolishness they think that is in Jesus, um, to try to embarrass him, to try to make him look foolish in front of the people, according to their own understanding, which is faulty. So what do we see here? Uh, they come to him and ask him the question about, um, they say, Teacher, Moses wrote for us that if a man's brother dies, having uh, a wife but no children, the man must take a widow and raise up offspring for his brother. So there's seven brothers. The first took a wife, died without children. And he, they go on and on and on so that they understand that uh, all seven were married to this woman. Uh, and they ask this question, um, which, uh, which one... Will be uh, will be the wife or the husband of this woman in the resurrection since they were all married to her in life. Now Jesus, he doesn't answer. Oh well, the first because this, or the second because this, or the third because this. He doesn't answer within the confines of their faulty understanding. So Jesus illustrates how to answer and when to answer perfectly for us here, because he does answer. But he doesn't answer under the umbrella of their false assumptions about the Word of God. He corrects their false assumptions, and then uh, they have their answer, and their foolishness is exposed. He says, The sons of this age marry and are given in marriage, but those who are considered worthy to attain to that age and to the resurrection from the dead neither marry nor are given in marriage. They can't die anymore. They are equal to angels and are sons of God, being sons of the resurrection. But that the dead are raised, even Moses showed in the passage about the bush, where he calls the Lord the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. Now he is not the God of the dead, but the God of the living, for all who uh, for all live to him. Now what's interesting here is that Jesus, he corrects their foolish assumptions. And he answers, but he does so in a way that doesn't draw him into their foolishness, but it instead exposes their foolishness. Um, then some of the scribes uh, answered, Teacher, you have spoken well. And it says, uh, verse 40, they no longer dared to a uh, ask him any question. Uh, so, what we see here Jesus doing is answering, and he does answer a person who asks a foolish question, but he does so in a way that illustrates, uh, well, one, it, is, it, it illustrates his, his superior knowledge of God's word and, and understanding in God's word. Um, number two, he doesn't get sucked into their faulty worldview. Number three, it exposes their faulty worldview. And number four, it's for the benefit of everybody around and for our benefit as well as we read the Word of God. So Jesus really illustrates perfectly um, how we can understand how and when to answer. And so um, what I would like to do is I would like to help us um, just, to, uh, just to continue on with what we see here, what we've seen here in the Proverbs, what we see here in uh, in Luke, and how do we respond? And I would just say very simply, uh, when we are asked questions, number one, let's ask what's the motivation of the person here? Let's think about it, right? We're, we're called to be slow to speak. And so when we have a person ask us a question, 
um, we need to think, what's their motivation here? Uh, is it a person who actually desires to, uh, to know? Is this a person who, who really wants to know an answer? Because then even if they're asking a question, which seems foolish, um, they may desire an answer and you can take them to God's word and show them the answer to their question based directly on the source of knowledge, which is God's word. So number one, think about the motivation. Uh, because if a, if a person is only trying to make you look foolish, it may be wiser just to walk away. Another question you might ask is who is around? Um, I, I wonder myself if there had been nobody around but just the Sadducees and Jesus, and there hadn't been this greater crowd, and there weren't scribes and other people around to benefit, and, and there weren't people who were going to record it for us in God's word, would Jesus have even answered? I think the answer to that question would be no. Uh, the Proverbs tell us that, that, that uh, rebuking a fool is, is, in many cases, pointless. And so uh, Proverbs 9, um, I don't remember the specific verses, uh, 7 through seven through um, 12 really illustrates, uh, especially uh, 7 where he says, uh, whoever corrects a mocker will invite insults, whoever rebukes uh, the wicked uh, incurs abuse. Uh, again in verse 8 he says they'll hate you. And so just addressing the fool uh, is going to be, in most cases, pointless. And so I would say look around and see, you know, who, is, who else is there? And is somebody else going to benefit from your answer? Um, if it's only the fool, honestly, I would encourage uh, walking away because it's pointless to get drawn into an argument with somebody who, number one, they don't actually want to know the answer. They just want to make you look stupid. Uh, number two, they're not listening to your answer because their knowledge and their wisdom is based on themselves. They are the standard of their own wisdom and their own knowledge. They're the center of their own universe. They're the hero of their own story. Um, they, they don't care to listen to anybody else's opinion. They don't care to grow in wisdom or insight. So if there's nobody else around, don't waste your time. Um, I, I'm pretty sure Jesus would not have wasted his time in answering somebody who is never going to listen. I'm pretty sure that the answer here that we have in, in chapter 20 is for the benefit of other people who were there, for the benefit of Jesus' disciples, um, perhaps for the benefit of some of the people among the scribes and Pharisees who would eventually believe, uh, and definitely for the, for the benefit of everybody who's ever read, read the Bible. Um, so, um, think who's around you. Uh, and... Uh, another, another question to ask yourself is, what is your motivation in answering? Um, are you trying to look like the wise person? Are you trying to have other people in the group who are there look to you as the one who can answer? Um, because it, in that case, you're being foolish. You're looking for honor for yourself when honor only properly belongs to God. To God be all the glory, right? So... Um, Think about what's your motivation for answering. And I think if we consider these things, right, what is the motivation of the person asking? Who else is around that may benefit from an answer? Uh, three, make sure that our answer is based directly on the Word of God if we do answer. Uh, and, and, and four, what is your goal in answering? Is your goal to bring honor and glory to God and to benefit the people around who, who perhaps would benefit from the answer? Or is it just to make yourself look wise? So I think if we, if we keep these things in mind and if we look at the godly example that we have in Jesus, especially uh, in Luke chapter uh, 20, um, I think it's Mark chapter 12 is the corresponding uh, chapter in Mark. I don't uh, so um, I think if we do these things and we examine our heart, uh, then we will not be drawn into foolish arguments where we'll end up uh, either um, looking foolish ourselves, as verse 4 warns, or increasing the wisdom uh, of, the, of the foolish person in his own sight. In other words, uh, building him up uh, in his folly. Um, making him even more secure in his foolishness. Um, so let's pray that God would give us wisdom in answering or not answering.
Heavenly Father, uh, God, thank you so much for your word. Thank you that um, you have told us who you are, that you have told us what real wisdom and what real knowledge are, um, and that you have called us all uh, to submit to your um, to your word, to how you explain who you are in your word, to how you explain uh, how we ought to behave in light of who you are, how we ought to regard you. Um, God, thank you so much for the gospel, because if you simply told us who you were and and told us how we were, but gave us no hope of redemption, God, your word would convict and condemn every one of us, and there would be no hope at all for us. God, thank you so much for the hope of the gospel, that even though every one of us, um, outside of our submission to you, is a fool, and and will will get the same uh, would get the same result the same ultimate shame, the same ultimate punishment and condemnation uh, if you did not offer redemption, uh, forgiveness of sins, reconciliation uh, through the gospel of Jesus Christ. God, I pray that, um, that our goal in the church, anytime we teach, anytime we speak, anytime we answer a question, um, that our goal would be to give you honor and glory that would be, uh, our, our goal would be that, um, that a person's apprehension of you would increase in its correctness through interactions with us. That we would help people to better know who you are and better understand your truth so that you can receive all the praise and honor and glory. Uh, God, I pray that our goal would never be to increase um, our stature uh, in front of other people. Uh, to at all share in, 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 in honor that only belongs to you. God, thank you so much. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, Grace, uh, have a great day. We love you. Can't wait to see you on Sunday.